Good morning, and Boker Tov, and welcome back to Parsha Perspectives for today. So good to be together, as always, study the Parsha Pa'aloscha, and to extract the lessons, the perspectives for today. I want to begin with our attitude of gratitude, as always. A big thank you to our generous sponsors, Becky and Avi Katz and family, who sponsored the Parsha Perspective series for the year in memory of Becky's father, David Grossman, David Ben Menachem Manish. Also, a reminder, if you've not yet signed up for our one and one campaign, please do so. One dollar a day of stucco, one minute a day of Torah learning, all in the merit of Esti Moskowitz, Esther Tehila Basari Yatsipora. All those who are ill should have a speedy and a painless for Shlema, a full and speedy recovery. Also, a reminder, our Pasha perspectives for today are now being written up. You could print them out and read them at your Shabbos table. Three beautiful Divrei Torah, one for each meal. Subscribe to our newsletter. Details are right here on the screen. Okay, Parshas Be'alos. Let's begin. God speaks to Moshe saying, Speak to your brother. When you light the lamps, when you kindle the candelabra towards the face of the menorah, the seven candles should face, they should illuminate, they should light. Says Rashi here on our Pasuk. Why is the story, why is the lesson or the obligation of the menorah adjacent juxtaposed to the story of the Nesim? Last week's Parsha, we had the seemingly or repetitive and redundant sacrifices that were offered by the princes, the Nesim. So why did we end last week's Parsha? All 12 Nesim seem to bring the exact same carbon, but we know that two chefs, two cooks, but put in the same spices, they could follow the same recipe. It's going to turn out entirely different. And the same is true for our great sages, our great leaders, our great Nesim. Says Rash Lafi Kishara, Aaron Chanukah Sanasim, Chol Shadaito Shaloya Iman Bachanuka, Lohu Velo Shifto. When Aaron saw the Nesim got to bring these great gifts, when he witnessed each of the leaders, the heads of the tribes, brought their own sacrifice, he felt very demoralized. He was saddened. Shaloya Iman Bachanuka, he wasn't part of this inauguration. Not him and not his tribe. Don't worry, God says to Aram, your lot is greater than theirs. They bring the sacrifice, but you, you're going to kindle, you're going to light the menorah each and every day. You're going to light the menorah each and every week. You're going to light the menorah each and every year. We've spoken about this many times before. Aaron seems to be like an impetuous child, God forbid. Quite crying and complaining and fetching. It's not fair to me. How come I don't get to bring the sacrifices? Aaron? This is Aaron Akoin? Why is he fetching? Why is he crafting? Peleplos. Halamalas Aaron Akoin Beshevit Levi Atsuma. Aaron Akoin and the whole tribe of Levi have an incredibly distinguished and noble position. Because Baruch Hu says about them himself, the Leviim are for Hashem. They are the chosen ones. They have positions of distinction. They have a leadership role. And among Shevet Levi, among the Kohanim, there's no one greater than Aaron. Aaron is the Kohen Gadol. He's the high priest. He's the Gadol Shebe Gedolim. He is Kedushos Olamala Mikol Kla Yisrael. He has the highest level of sanctity, the highest level of holiness, the highest status, the highest identity, greater even than Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe is not the Kohen Gadol. So how could Aaron, who touches and attains the pinnacle, Aaron who climbs to the very top, this is the Aaron who's jealous? I would understand someone who doesn't have a role. I would understand somebody who feels they're on the outs. But Aaron, he's the holiest. Aaron, he's the most distinguished. Chol Shadaito. He becomes despondent. He has despair. He becomes demoralized. Because Baruch has to be fias. Hashem has to appease him. How can it be? What's going on here? Says Rabbi Chesko Levenstein. Shadar kum shalan shem ayla shatam utam shaldar gaburuch nius. You see that what a person is competitive for says everything about them. A person who has drive, who has ambition, where is our drive? And how is our ambition directed? Bigger house, nicer car, more money, finer things. Upgrade the latest, the newest, the biggest, the best. For the holy, for the spiritual, for the person who's at a high level. Their she'ifa, their goal, their aim, their ambition, their drive is in Ruchnis, is in Torah. Aaron is not envious or jealous that he says, take it away from them and give it to me. Envy is forbidden as usr when you say, I deserve not the other. When you say, take it from them and give it to me, I deserve much more. 
But when you say, I want also, I want in addition, why not me? Why not me? Says Rabbi Yechezko Levenstein, Mashkiach or Yechezko, this is the greatness of Aaron. He was sad. There's an opportunity to come close to you, Hashem. There's an opportunity for spirituality. There's an opportunity to experience a closeness and a connection with you. I want it. And Chavre, this is the theme of our Pasha. We'll have in our Pasha later, Pesach Sheni. This group, we'll get to it and we'll see. Why are we left out? Why are we deprived of the opportunity, of the chance? Who in the right mind? Who today, if given a year off from Pesach, don't clean, don't offer the carbon, don't make your way to Yerushalayim, don't worry about the cost, don't worry, you get a year off. Everyone would say, Psh, okay, not asking any questions, taking my year off. But not, not that demographic, not that group, not those who were ineligible for the first Pesach. They said, Lama Nigara, why should we miss out? You see, when you're spiritually demoralized, when you're spiritually disconnected, when you're spiritually dry, then when you have a chance to be off the hook, you're grateful, you're glad, you're excited. No tachanan, great. Less davening, no tachanan. But when you're an Aaron HaKohen, when you are the generation who pushed and pressured Moshe, what about Pesach Sheni? Then you don't say, great, I'm off, a break, a vacation. You say, lama nigara. You say, it's not fair to me. Chol Shadaito, Aaron says, everyone else has the chance. I want in. I want that opportunity. I want that chance. I want to be able to come close. The Zchor David, a sefer by Rav David Milanovsky, who is the Rosh Hashiva of Or Torah, he says, Hashem appeases Aaron. How does he appease Aaron? He appeases Aaron by telling him, don't worry, don't worry. Yours is greater than theirs. How does that make him better? In what way is lighting the menorah greater than the Karbonos? These Karbonos were many animals, multi-animals. These Karbonos were and high profile, and Aaron is cleaning out and lighting the candelabra. In what way is it greater? So it says the Zechor David, Shekakol Shekorbanos and Isimai Pu'ulu Gedolim in his Gava, the Cholzos Pu'ulu Chad Pa'amis. These Karbanos were offered one time. It was a one time event, one time experience. It was lofty, it was noble, it was beautiful, it was high profile, but it was one time. But Aaron, Hadlaka Saneresi Pu'ulu Kvua Yom Yomis. Aaron, you have consistent, it is constant, it is ongoing, and therefore it is greater. Sometimes we think that that which gains or garners the greatest attention, the biggest stage, the highest profile, that's what's big, that's what's significant, that's what's important. And the small, little, seemingly insignificant things, the everyday mundane, that's unimportant. But here, HaKadosh Baruch the Almighty tells Aaron, what you have is Gedola Mishalachem, yours is greater. Because in fact, the capacity to maintain the consistency, the ability to have the continuity, the ability to be reliable and dependable in the seemingly small, but to show up and to do what's needed and to do so without fanfare, that's in fact greater. That is in fact loftier. That is in fact a higher level. So you see from Aaron's reaction and Hashem not telling Aaron, grow up, what are you complaining about? How can you be fetching? It's not fair to me. In stack, Hashem says, wow, that's fantastic. Hashem validates Aaron's feeling and then tells him, don't worry, you get to light the candles and that's greater. You see that a healthy competitiveness in spirituality, a, a competitive nature can sometimes be good. Competitiveness is not good if it's a win-lose, if you're trying to defeat the other. But in Stephen Covey's model of a win-win, if you say you succeed, you grow, you climb that spiritual mountain, I don't want it instead of you, I don't want it in lieu of you, I want it in addition to you. To see someone who's an amazing davener, someone who's a great learner, see someone who's an incredible instinct for chesed, for tzedakah, and you say, not that I want that honor or glory, or I want that skill or capacity. Instead, I want it in addition. I too have the drive, have the ambition. I want to be like them. Hashem rewarded, He appeased, He acknowledged. And He said, don't worry. When you see someone who's getting the fanfare, who's got the feature, that's one time, that's not great. Greatness is reliability, dependability. Greatness is found in the small, seemingly insignificant. Greatness is showing up each and every day. That is greatness. It's a beautiful Ramban here. I don't think we have time to get into it. We discussed it in the past. When the Ramban says that, Aaron, don't worry, your descendants, the Chashmonayim, they're going to light the menorah forever. The Hanukkah hadn't yet happened. 
the story of the miracle of lighting the menorah hadn't yet happened. The story of Hanukkah hadn't yet happened. How does the Ramban make sense? How does the Ramban understand that's what possibly is the conversation happening here in the Torah that precedes by a long time the story of Hanukkah? What does that mean? What does that mean? Is for another time we could dive deep into it. But let's keep going. Paraches Pasuk Gimel. Let's keep going. Oh, one more idea. Or one more before we keep going. What was this under the Ramban? There's a lot to unpack about the Ramban. We'll just do a little bit. What was the Maila Gedola of Beis Hashmonai? That was Gedola Me'avodos Karbanas Beis HaMikdash. What the Hashmonai, according to the way the Ramban understands this conversation. Aaron says, it's not fair to me. I didn't get to bring the sacrifices. Hashem says, relax. They did was only when the Beis HaMikdash existed. But you were the sense, the Hashmonai, they're going to step up. They're going to light the candles. And that will transcend even when there is the Golos Yavan. Even when there is that exile of Yavan. Says of Steinman Zetzal in the Zayel HaShachar. He says the Nesim, they brought the Chanukah some Mizbeach, the Karbanos, which is very lofty, it's very great. It's one of the Avodas, the three things the world rests on. Torah Avodah, Gminus Chasodim, gives Hashem a great Nachas Ruach. Hashem has a great joy and a great satisfaction. However, Nidvasam Aysim Mugbelas Bamidam Esuyemes, Parachad, Ayelachad, Karas Kesev, Mezua Kesev, Kaf Malaya Ketores, it was defined. They had a specific Karban they were each meant to bring. It was overlapping, it was the same, but it wasn't redundant, as we said. Each chef brings the recipe, but adds their own kinech, their own flavor, their own spice. It comes out different, the individuality. But it was defined. There were boundaries. There were parameters. However, the avodos chashmonayim was belishim tanayim. There were no boundaries. There was nothing that held them back. They overcame misyonos kashim. It was an exile. It was a gauz yavan. They sacrificed themselves with a mysterious nefesh. The nesim also gave of themselves dedicated and devoted and contributed their very selves. But they did so under certain pleasant, comfortable circumstances. The Chashmonayim, Chashmonayim showed Mesiris Nefesh. Shecha Gedola Mishelahem. That which we have to give with Mesiris Nefesh, that which we have to give with extra effort and sacrifice and compromise and difficulty, that's the Dore Doros. That is everlasting. That is the most transformational. And that's why what you have is greater, in fact, even than theirs. Okay, let's keep going. Pasuk tells us after Aaron receives this instruction, the Ha'alos Chesaneros, Ha'alos Chesaneros. So fascinating question. The Megid Yosef of Sirotkin wonders: When it comes to Mizbeach, there's a ramp. You're not allowed to climb on steps. You can't expose or reveal your nakedness. You can't stand still in the approach to the Mizbeach. So there's a ramp. You have to run up. And yet, when it comes to the Menorah, there's a step. There's a platform. Aaron ascends Ha'alos Chah when you ascend the platform to light the Menorah. In what way are the menorah and the mizbeach different that it's okay for the menorah to have a platform when the mizbeach has a ramp, not a platform? He asks a great question. Curious if you have a good answer, let me know. But next, Pasuk. Pasuk Gimel. They ask Aaron. Aaron gets the instructions to light the menorah, and he does so. menorah. He lights facing the menorah. Just as he is commanded. And Rashi tells us on this Pasuk, Vayas Kain Aaron, the Aaron did exactly as he was commanded. Lehagid to tell us, Shivacho shall Aaron shaloshina. This is the greatness of Aaron. Aaron did not deviate, he did not change. He followed the instruction verbatim. He followed what he was asked to do exactly. He was very exacting and scrupulous and vigilant. Now, that's a beautiful comment, endorsement of Aaron. But we have thought for a moment, would we have hesitated or considered? Would we have contemplated that Aaron? was going to inject his own creativity, distort, manipulate, change. What does that mean that Aaron didn't change? That's a compliment for an Aaron? So in a letter of the altar of Kelm to one of the Vadeh Musar of his Talmidim, he said, A person is not judged by the, the large and the great things. Sometimes we can rise to the occasion. We're asked to do something monumental, something extraordinary. We can rise to the occasion of something enormous. Lasag batzalas nefashos, to get involved in saving lives, to dig deep into our pocket, to write a big check, to sacrifice our time, our resources, to show up. But amivchana amiti, the real test of a person is not when the lights and the camera are on, when the stage is set. They're not in the big and the large monumental moments. They're in the small moments. Do we do the way we're meant to do? Do we act and do we respond and do we do when no one's watching? 
I had a Rebbe used to say, you know, sometimes you see someone, they get an aliyah to the Torah. They're called up to the Torah. And the way they recite that birchas at Torah, Asher b'charbanu mikol amim, such kavana, they krechts it out, they scream it out, they cry it out with such intense kavana. I said, but, you know, when they're not getting that aliyah, every one of us recite the birchas at Torah every morning. It's part of our morning routine, part of our birchas hashachar. When no one's around and you're at home and you're getting your day started, when you're just launching into your birchas hashachar, you're not standing on the bima, and everybody's not watching and listening, and nobody hears. Do you say the Birchas HaTorah the same way you do when you're getting an aliyah to the Torah? It's the small, seemingly insignificant. It's the daily, consistent routine. That's what speaks about a person. That's what testifies to the person. That's what the Mishnah Pirkei Avos tells us. That a person should treat what seems like a small, insignificant thing like a great thing. The great and the righteous would pay attention and be vigilant with that which seems small, like it was great. The extent that he went, the distance that he went, the sacrifice that he went, and he had his family involved. He got his wife, he got his son. Run, don't move slowly. Run, go above and beyond. Go above. You know, this was a, this was, custodial, janitorial, cleaning out the candelabra, setting up the wicks to light it again. You know, this doesn't seem significant. The Shamash would do it, not the Rebbe. You know, this would be the Talmud, not the Rosh Hashiva, to stand and to toil, to remove the old wicks, to clean it out, to fill it up, to add the new wicks. And yet, for Aaron, it never got old. It never grew rote. It never grew stale. It never lost its excitement. Why? Why? So this is the author of Kelm's Insight. Why Vayas came Aaron? Why was Aaron Lahagit Shvachosh Lashina? He never changed, he never deviated, it never got old. What didn't change was not the performance and the way he did the mitzvah. What didn't change was his words. He didn't change. He didn't become too arrogant or too egotistical. He didn't become too elevated, too much above being able to do this mitzvah for Aaron. Psh, what a gift, what an opportunity, what an invitation. Why? How was he able to preserve that level? of excitement, enthusiasm, alacrity. How did Aaron get as equally excited? It's Shabbos again. It's davening again. It's an opportunity for tzedakah, a mitzvah again. It's a chesed, a bikr cholim, a nicham avelim again. How was it, Shaloshina, that he never changed? He never got old. It never grew stale. He never felt above it. The answer is found in the Pasuk itself, says the author of Kelm. You know what the answer is? Kasher tziva Hashem es Moshe. When you feel that this is your, this is what Hashem commanded. This is our mission. This is what he expects. This is what he wants. This is how we come close. Mitzvah, kasher tziva, tzava, tzava, tzavos is to create a connection, a bond. Says the altar. At the time, Vilna, the great city, this is what he writes in Chochmon, Musr, Chelik Beis, the altar of Kelm, this letter. He says, a minion of 10 who are excited to be there, who are davening and giving their all, who are fully mindful and present as they pray, they might as well be in the great shul of Vilna with thousands of people. It's not a matter of how size, small, big, large. It's not a matter of how ornate. It's a matter of our attitude. It's the story of uh, Chaim Oizer Grzynski once went to Krakow in Galicia, and he had a certain meeting. The problem is that he had a coat, a, a, his coat, his rabbinic garb got torn. He had a tear, and he went to a tailor. He found the name of a tailor. He was in a great uh, meeting in Krakow. And Reb Chaim Meiser, the great postlik, arguably the greatest postlik of his generation, the great Reb Chaim Meiser in uh, Krakow had this tear. He couldn't appear that way. So he found a tailor, and he went to tailor's home, and he asked the tailor if he could repair the tear. The tailor said, absolutely. I just need a moment because it was Hanukkah. I just need to light the Hanukkah licht. I need to light the Hanukkah candles, and then I can repair your tear. So Chaim Meiser said, this simple tailor, how long will it take him to light the Hanukkah candles? A minute? Two? But he watched. Chaim Oizer watched. And he couldn't believe what he saw. What happened? What happened? He was not a yada of this tailor. Went and first he washed his hands. And then he took off his weekday shmata, his clothing, his, his tailor garb. And instead he put on his big day Shabbos. He went and he transformed himself into his Shabbos clothing. He washed his hands. And then he lit the Hanukkah candles with all of his heart and all of his soul and all of his kavan of all his mindfulness. And then he sang slowly and with feeling Ma'os Tzur. 
and it took half an hour, 45 minutes, until finally he turned to Rechaim Moizer, and he was ready to repair his garment. Rechaim Moizer would tell this story over and over, and he would say, you see, this is why Galicia, Krakow, are such great cities of Torah. Because even the simple tailor approaches a mitzvah with excitement, with joy, with enthusiasm, with alacrity. It never grows old, it never grows stale, it never becomes rote. Put on your Shabbos clothing, you wash your hands, you slowly, mindfully pay attention and insert your entire self. This was the Shavach of an Aaron that he never changed, it never grew old, it never grew stale. In the Sefer Emes Ve'emunah that we've been learning from uh, Kotzker, from Kotz. So it says the following: Kotzker would quote the Yira Kadosh, a Yehudi Kadosh, b'shosh aberach b'chiyom ha bracha shelo asani goy, hirgish benafsho, shenishtana b'chol yom k'mo me'ini Yehudi li Yehudi. That the Yira Kadosh would describe that when he would make the bracha every morning in his birchas hashachar, he'd say the bracha shelo asani goy. Thank you, Hashem, that I was not born a non-Jew, not discriminating and not biased and not disparaging non-Jews, but it means non-Jews only have seven mitzvahs, and we have 613. So we're so grateful for the opportunity and invitation to do more mitzvahs. And the Yerah Kaddish would feel when he made that bracha every day, when he said that bracha, Shlo Goy, he felt like he converted, like he transformed from a non-Jew to a Jew. The Kotzker would add, that's what Rashi meant here. Aaron did similarly, he didn't change. What does that mean? Shalom his yashin. The word shina can mean he didn't change. He didn't distort. He didn't pervert. He didn't manipulate. He didn't change the mitzvah. He followed through exactly as his brother had commanded, as he told him. He didn't change it whatsoever. However, the Kutzker understood it differently. Instead of seeing the word shina as to change, shalom his yashan at slow, it didn't become old. Something old, yashan is old, old, outdated, archaic stale, old. You know, we live in a time, we live in a, in a generation that old, outdated, we're constantly upgrading. We need the latest model. We need the upgrade. We turn it in and we upgrade, upgrade our phone and upgrade our operating system and upgrade our car. And unfortunately and tragically, people try to upgrade members of their family, upgrade their marriage. We're living with the mentality of a disposable society where we're constantly seeking to upgrade. So says the, the Kotzker, Applying the insight of the Yira Kadosh, the Yira Kadosh said, every day Shalosan Igoi was like he became new again, he was born again, born Jewish again, as if he just became Jewish again, he just became Bar Mitzvah again, just became Bas Mitzvah again, just became obligated in Mitzvahs again. They asked Cain Aaron, that's what Aaron did. Shaloshina doesn't mean he didn't change. Shaloshina, it didn't become Yasham, it never got old, it never grew stale, it never grew old. It never became outdated. It was fresh and it was new. Mechadash. It wasn't yashan. It wasn't old. Could add similarly, maybe not only yashan old. Yashen means to sleep. Shiloshina. He never slept. Walked through it. How many of us sleep? Walk through life. People finish davening. They don't even remember coming to shul. They don't remember opening the sitter. They don't remember taking three steps forward. By the time they take the three steps back. We sleepwalk through mitzvahs. We sleepwalk through learning. We finish listening to the laugh, learning the daf. We don't even know what daf. We don't even know what it was about. We're sleeping with our eyes open. We're sleepwalking through life. Shiloshina, Yashan, it wasn't old. Yashan, he wasn't sleepwalking. And it never lost his enthusiasm for it. Okay. Perchaf, Perches, rather, Pasuk, Vav. Moving right along. The next section, the consecration, the sanctification of the Levium, their great place of distinction. Take the Levium from the Jewish people, and purify them. What does it mean? Moshe is instructed, take the Levium. How is he meant to take them? In handcuffs? With a rope? With a straitjacket? Throw them in the back of a truck? What does it mean? Take them. Take them and purify them, because they're closest. You see that those who are meant to be role models, those who are meant to be teaching and leading and modeling, they need to demand more of themselves, more is expected of them. They have to live a higher level. The tiyarto, some you have to live a higher level of purity. But says Rashi, kaches levim, what does that mean? Kach bidvarim. Rashi says, kaches levim, how do you take them? Bidvarim, with words. Oh, you see something so important. Recently on Bind the Bima, we had Ali Sheva a marriage and family therapist. And she spoke about how you could be the type of person that others are comfortable to disagree with. 
How can you be the type of humble and modest person? How can you make space and room for others to be able to disagree with you? Says Rashi, Kach, take them how? Bidvarim, with persuasion. Use your words. Don't overpower and don't weaponize and don't abuse and don't bully and don't use force. We have to learn the power of persuasion to speak. And if you can't persuade successfully, then you make space and room for other people to have different opinions. So other people have different opinions. What a beautiful insight. And you see this throughout our Torah often. When we talk about dvarim, kach, how does kach kicha is described not to take forcefully, not to take physically, but bidvarim, with our words. With our words are the way that we're meant to, to capture. Okay, perches, pasuk yotes. Still here on, on uh, perches and the consecration of the levim. Pasuk yotes. Ve'etnas ha-levim nesun la'arun levanam yisok b'nei Yisrael. Assign the Levium to be presented to Aaron and his sons from among Kla Yisrael. They're meant to serve and to work for the Jewish people. And the children of Israel attempt to meet him to provide atonement for them so there won't be a plague among Kla Yisrael when they approach the Kodesh, when they approach the sanctuary and the holy and the holy place. The etna is the Levium. Zag Rashi says Rashi here on this. The etnes levim. You notice in this pasuk, how many times does it say Bnei Israel? We got it. The children of Israel, Hashem, your people, your nation, your children. I got it. The etnes levim is la'on levana bitoch Bnei Israel. Lavodas avodas Bnei Israel. Lachaper al Bnei Israel. V'lo ye b'Bnei Israel negef begeshes Bnei Israel el hakodesh. Where's the camera? Five times. No less than five times. Why five times? When you hear the number five, it should elicit an association. What is the number five reminiscent of? Five times it says, Bnei Yisrael. Why? To reference, just like the Chumash. It is the love and the affection that Hashem has for the Jewish people. It says our name five times. Just like the Chumash, just like the Chumash. What does one thing have to do with the other? What does the Chumash have to do with Hashem's love for us? Is it just a cute number? Five times were mentioned. Chumash, Chamesh, five books of Moshe. What does it mean? So the author of Kelm, so quoting several authors of Kelm here, he says the following. He says, I was moved. I was shocked. I was uplifted. Wow. I was wowed by the love and the affection that Hashem has for the Jewish people. Five times in one Pasuk. Hashem says the same name, the same words over and over again. If you look at the Pasuk grammatically, it would have worked out well to simply say our name once. Why five? You say... My tire kind, my beautiful son, my beautiful daughter, my child. You say their name. You love that child over and over and over again. You say their name. A name is an expression of affection. A name elevates. A name creates a bond and a connection and a closeness. So says the altar of Kelm. Had it not been written in the Torah, you wouldn't believe it. The love a father could have for a child. The love Hashem has for us. Kosh Baruch Hu loves us. That level of affection, of connection, that level of elevating us by using our name. If he shows this love to us, we have to reciprocate. And we should love him back. That devotion, that dedication, that love back to him. You see from here this expression of affection, this incredible love, this connection, and this close. But it goes, it goes further. There's a beautiful insight here from Rav Gedaya Eisen, who was the Mashkiach of Kol Torah, on this Rashi. What did Chazal meant? Five times the words B'nai Yisrael and Chamisha Chomshei Torah, the five books of Moshe. What's the connection? What's the connection? Bo Chazal Lamednu B'zeh Shekom Malas Levim Novas Mikoach HaKlal Yisrael K'vish Matzinu B'divri Rash HaPasuk Hu Asacha V'Yechon Neneka Mikem konim, mikem malachem, krach shakol taloi bo. Hariz the idea chashuva. It's a critical, critical notion. The idea that a tamachacham, a tzaddik, a rosh a rebbe, a rav derives their power 
derives their leadership, derives their strength, derives their creativity, derives their chidushim from the kawach of the tzibor, from the strength and the merit of the community, of the community. That's where it comes from. And that's what the Pasuk means to tell us here, that so we derive our strength. A second by the Bima reference, when we had Rabbi Mansur Shlita, he spoke about the fact that when he goes in Scala and Residence and he speaks elsewhere, takes him longer to prepare, and it's much harder to give a successful drasha. When you're home, you're kihila, you're tzibur, it's the koach, that's what gives the rabbi, the rav, the speaker, the rabbits and strength, that's what gives them the creativity, that's what gives them the leadership. And that's chamish pa'amim, odechi bashan chamishay chumshay Torah. That's where this power comes from. That's where that merit comes from. It comes, the power of Torah comes from the community. Kla Yisrael chamushay chumshay Torah. The five times B'nai Yisrael, the five times of chumash, the power of Torah comes from the unity and the connection of Klal Yisrael, of Klal Yisrael. I saw another insight of where it may come from. I don't remember where I saw this. Was this Kutsk? Maybe it was from the Kutsker. But I might have thought there's a distinction, but there's a difference. Oh, maybe the Kutsker. Were mentioned so many times, just like the Chumash. Oh, this is a Katzker. Levim are separated out. Levim are not included in the census in the count of Klal Yisrael. Levim have a position of distinction. The rest of the Jewish people might have gotten said that we lost our power, we lost our sanctity, we lost our holiness. Who are we and what are we? We are failures. We flopped. We came up short. The Levim didn't participate in the ego. They're counted separately. And they're charged with a mission and a mandate with a greater level of holiness. All the holiness went to them. And who and what are we? Lachen chibay yisir in adas lahem. Says the Kotzker. Hashem showed a special affection. You're not farfs. You're not rejects. You're not failures. Shenim shuli Yisrael lachamish echom Torah. And that's where the metaphor, the parallel to Chumash comes in. Says the Kotzker. Each is its own book. In fact, we get into that in our parsha. Really, there were seven books, not five. Ibn saw Aaron is bracketed by those nuns. How many books of Torah are there? Each is a distinct unit. Each sefer of Chumash is its own unit. It's its own sefer, and yet they combine to create Torah. Chamishe Chumshe Torah. It's the five books of Moshe, but known as the five books, simultaneously it is the one Torah. The calls us a threefold people. We're made up of Quran and Levim in Yisraelim. You're the Kutzker uses Korach's words, but in the positive sense, that Kulam Kedoshim, all of us are holy. We are a threefold people. They're Kohanim Levim and Yisraelim, Yisraelim, three identities, three demographics, three separate units. But just like there are five separate books, but they comprise the one Torah, each of us is our own book. Each of us is our own chapter. Each of us is in our own tribe. Each of us is made up of different Kohanim Levim and Yisraelim. And yet, we are one people. So therefore, says the Kotzker, that's what the Pasuk was telling us. Kaj Baruch with the Chiba, the love that he has, don't feel you're rejected. Don't feel you're a failure. Don't feel that Hashem gave up hope on you. And he turned only to the Leviim, just like Chumash are five separate books, but they make up one Sefer. Kala Yisrael are each separate people, but we make up one. We make up of separate tribes, or separate groups, Kohan and Leviim, Yisraelim, but we make up one Kala Yisrael. Okay, that was the altar of Kelm. And that is the the uh Gedalia Eisenman. Okay, moving along. Peraktes Pasuk Zion. Peraktes. Moving along. Apprenticeship, responsibility, the different ages. Peraktes Pasuk Zion. Oh, now we come to the Pesach Shein. We alluded to it earlier. 
that just like Aaron had aspiration and ambition, he didn't only want to kill it in Gashmias, he wanted to kill it in Ruchmias. You know, we have this notion of being mistapik b'mua, a person be able to be satisfied with little. We have a notion, samech b'chelko. Do we apply samech b'chelko to Ruchmias? Do we say be satisfied with your lot in spirituality? Or do we say no breakthrough barriers, push further, be ambitious, be driven, be competitiveness, be competitive. When it comes to Ruchnias, when it comes to the pursuit of the spiritual, maybe we shouldn't be Samech Bechelko. We don't say my lot is to come late, leave early, have no kavana. We don't say my lot is to barely learn, not learn, or learn superficially. We don't say my lot. We say no, I'm capable, I'm driven, I want more. That certainly is the tradition that we have from our own, the beginning of the Parsha. And now that we have from those who were impure because they participated in the Pesach Sheni, we've spoken about this in the past, they were carrying the bones of Yosef. Yosef is the king of second chances. He gives his brother a second chance. He gives Hashem a second chance. And therefore, they were given, Klaiser were given a second chance. That's the holiday of second chances. But it's also the holiday of Lama Nigara. Why Hashem, don't you trust me? So Perek Tess, Pasuk, Zion, why should I lose that? Why should I be deprived? So the people say, sorry, Anachnu Tmeim. So these people tell Moshe, they confront him, they say, We're impure, we're contaminated. Why should we lose out? Why don't we get to pay? Why don't we get to offer the sacrifice? Why? Why? So Rashi here says, This story of Pesach Sheni, the notion of those who were contaminated, ineligible to participate in the first Pesach, and they were given the second Pesach, this law should have been introduced and taught by Moshe. However, instead of Moshe being the one to initiate and to capture and to communicate this law, it was done through this group of people. What was their merit? These people who couldn't bring the Pesach, and they came to Moshe with this taina. And Moshe asked Hashem, and Hashem taught Moshe, and a new halacha was introduced called Pesach Sheni. And Rashi says, Could have been done. There was another way out. Could have been taught through Moshe. It's because of this parsha. It's because of this conversation. Because of this challenge and complaint that we every year have Pesach Sheni. But what is Pesach Sheni? This whole thing came about because of a few people. These were fringe. These were outliers. They were impure. They were contaminated. They couldn't participate. So they were a fringe group of individuals, a fringe group of outliers. So what? why are we commemorating it? Each and every year we honor, we commemorate. We don't say Tachanan. Many of the men to eat matzah on Pesach Sheni. All because of a group of individuals, all because of a group of outliers couldn't participate in the carbon, says Rav Zedel Epstein, one of our fan favorites, Rav Zedel Epstein, the Mashkiach of Torah, or based on something Rav Sadek Akon writes in Pritzadik, that there's a big difference between Pesach Rishon and Pesach Sheni. Pesach Rishon, Achanas and Soros, Bo Min Hashemayim. Pesach Rishon is top down. Pesach Rishon, we are overwhelmed. Pesach Rishon, we get this burst, this breakthrough of illumination, of enlightenment, of incredible, incredible insight. Torah tells us that even when we were in Egypt, God carried us on, on, on eagles' wings. The Targum Yonasam, that Pasuk says, He took us from Mitzrayim on the wings of eagles to Yerushalayim to offer the first korban. What a night, Israel. What a night of overwhelming light and breakthrough and redemption from above. Pesach Sheni is not top down. Pesach Sheni is bottom up. Is bottom up. Moshe says to Kadosh Baruch Hu, Karban Hasa Betumah. Hu Dacha Usam B'Shem Alacha. Moshe at first pushed them away. Moshe resisted them. Moshe was reluctant. Moshe said they're wrong alachically, but they didn't agree. They refused to take no for an answer. They persevered. They pushed through. They were tenacious. Lama Nigara, like Aaron at the beginning of the Parsha. They refused to lose out, to miss out. We insist on saying Tachanan. What do you mean we're exempt? What do you mean we're out? What do you mean we're not entitled? And it's in their merit that we repeat it. This is the holiday of Lama Nigara. It's the yontav of Lama Nigara, of never being satisfied, 
of not saying it's good enough, of not having good, but striving for great. Striving for great, such a love, such a passion, such a commitment for Torah and mitzvahs. We need to live and model and instill in our families and those around us that we have an attitude of Lama Nikara. Lama Nikara, what do you mean? I can't miss Mara with a minion. I can't miss the tzedakah opportunity everybody else gave. I want to give to it too. What do you mean the chesed chance? What do you mean the learning, the shir? I want to be invited. I want to go. I want a chance. Every one of us. Lama nigara. It's the yantav of lama nigara. Perktes pasuk yud zayin. Perktes pasuk yud zayin. Turn the page. Seven, eight in the art scroll. Stone. Chumash. Perktes pasuk yud zayin. Oh, I love this section. The cloud of glory covered the Mishkan. And that's how they knew to go. There are all kinds of flight delays and cancellations and challenges. It's so hard to travel today. How did Klai Yisrael know? You know, all the people who wait by the gate and then they crowd the gate area and then they have a mosaic because everybody spent the money on the credit card. They didn't do it the old-fashioned way by flighting enough flight segments. And you have all the people who go on their wheelchairs who claim to not be able to walk on the way. And the miracle in the sky, 30,000 feet up, they are healed as soon as the plane lands. They don't need a wheelchair. They're able to run. Transportation is complicated and frustrating today. How did Klai Yisrael move around? How did they know? How did they know when it was their section? How did they know when they were called to board, to travel, to journey, to take off? How did they know? So the Pasuk tells us, Perik Tess, Pasuk Yidzayin. Pasuk itself tells us. That when the cloud was lifted from on top of the tent, that's when the Jewish people knew it was time to go. And where the cloud would rest, that's when they were meant to encamp. So do they know, was it time to go or was it time to stay? When Hashem said it was time to go, it's time to go. When Hashem said it's time to stop and to rest, it's time to stop and rest. All the days that the cloud would be on the Mishkan, that's when they would encamp. The Shla Kodesh says in this passage, we spoke about this on Shavuos. Our theme this past Shavuos was the uh, Harsina, Kabbalah Satorah, to get us ready for summer. All kinds of halachas of summer and travel and tefillah saderach and hagomel and kashring barbecues and all kinds of things. So I gave a shir on the Torah perspective on vacation and leisure and recreation and time out. And we quoted the Shla Kodesh. Shla Kodesh writes so beautifully. This pasuk was talking not only to the generation of the desert, that they would know to go and to stay based on the word of Hashem, but it's talking to us. Our life is filled with the same journeys as the Jewish people. We go and we come. We're at home and we're on the road. We are in the middle of our routine. And we take a break and we go on vacation. And the key, says the Shlach Kadosh, the core is, Api Hashem Yisau, the Api Hashem Yachanu. We don't leave relate religion in the shul of the base Medrash. Religion doesn't stay at home and not come with us on the road. But rather, wherever we are, whenever we are, api Hashem. Api Hashem. There's nothing wrong with taking time. There's nothing wrong with taking a vacation. There's nothing wrong with needing a break. There's nothing wrong with recreation. We had big, big, lots and lots of Mara Macomas, lots of sources to show. Not only is there nothing wrong, but it's our responsibility to the healthy mind and a healthy body and a healthy soul. And one needs to find that space. But you could do it in excess. A person could play golf and tennis and mahjong too much. Person can take too many vacations. Person can sleep too much. How do we know that right balance? How do we know how much? Says Lashla Kadosh, Api Hashem Yisau ve Api Hashem Yachanu. Shem comes with us. Is our vacation a Torah Dika vacation? Malaha Aretz Kinyanecha. The whole world is filled. Simple understanding that Pasuk Malaha Aretz Kinyanecha means that Hashem, you owe the ent- own the entire world. You've made a king and you have acquired the entire world as yours. But the alternative understanding is Malaha Aretz Kinyanecha. It means the whole world is filled with opportunities to come close to you. Malaha arts, the entire world is filled. Kinyanecha, ways that we can make a Kinyan, we can acquire you. Kadosh Baruch we could find you in the plane and on the cruise, we could find you in the sneer stick of beach or hike. Kadosh Baruch we can find you in the recreational activity that we're doing. We meant for it to be a spiritual activity. Api Hashem Yisau, the Api Hashem Yachanu. When we're home or when we're on the road, we can find you if it's Api Hashem. Gemar Shabbos tells us the following. Amar Ula, Kasavar Abiyosi, this is a beautiful Rav Chaim Shmulevitz. I don't remember if I said it before, but it bears repeating and saying again, it's so beautiful, along the same lines as the Shlach Kadosh, the Gemar Shabbos tells us that one of the Lama Tes Malachas, one of the 39 acts of creative labor, is Soser. You're not allowed to demolish or destroy. You can't deconstruct Soser. 
When do you violate the biblical prohibition of soser? When is it a biblical prohibition of demolishing? When it is soser amenas livnos. When you destroy on condition to build. Just like you're only liable for erasing if you plan to write on that spot, you're only liable for destroying when you plan to build on that spot. And the Gemara concludes that you're only so samanas livnos, but also makom. If you destroy as a precondition to be able to rebuild and renovate in the same spot, that's the biblical prohibition. If you destroy and you abandon, you don't plan on rebuilding there, it's rabbinically prohibited, but not biblically prohibited. Fred Reb Chaim Shmulevitz asks the great Mash Rosh Hashiv of the Mir. In the Sikhus Musar, wonders Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, I don't understand. It has to be Dumya de Mishkan. We learn out the 39 categories of creative labor. What's creative labor that we have to abstain and refrain from on Shabbos? We learn from whatever was deemed, whatever was determined to be creative labor to build the Mishkan a house for Hashem. It has to be Dumya de Mishkan for the Malacha to be biblically prohibited. The Av Malacha is similar to the way it was done in the Mishkan. The Mishkan wasn't so Amanas Livnos in the same place. In the Mishkan, we took apart the Mishkan in order to rebuild, but not to rebuild in the same place, to rebuild in the next place. So how could it be? How could you learn? How could you possibly learn? So Samanas Livnos is a Malacha from the Mishkan when it's not similar to the Mishkan. So Rechaim Shmulevitz gives a mushal. He gives a beautiful metaphor. He says, you know, imagine a mother with a baby travels, whether it's for family simchas, personal vacation, business. The mother with this tiny little baby, this tiny little infant, travels all over the world. Australia, South Africa, the Far East, United States, West Coast, East Coast, of course, Eretz Israel travels all over. When the mother returns, her passport will be stamped, each of those locations, each of those countries, each of those continents. But if you ask the baby, where were you? The baby will answer, in my mother's arms. This mother, literally or figuratively, wore a baby Bjorn or carried the baby in her arms or stroller. But the baby, from the baby's perspective, while the baby may be geographically was all over the world, the baby feels I was in my mother's arms all along. Says Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, when we were in the Mishkan, wherever the Mishkan was, we were in Hashem's arms. Api Hashem Yisov, Api Hashem Yachanu. We're in Hashem's embrace. We're in Hashem's vicinity. We are in place that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is embracing and loving and affectionately holding us wherever we are. So therefore, the Mishkan is the exception that even though geographically it may have moved, that was so sam and us lived us in the same place because we were in Hashem's arms. We were bechik imi. We were in Hashem's arms all the time, all the time. And that says, that's the Pasuk in Yermio that we say in the Yom Nuraim. Kom Hashem zachayt the chesed nuraim. Hashem, we remember the chesed. Hashem says, I remember the chesed. We were in the shade, the shadow, in the embrace of Hashem. We were invested entirely in our relationship with Him. We felt entirely protected from His shade, from His shadow. We were under His wings. Even if we went from place to place, it's as if we were in the same place. When a person, every step they take, every decision they make, every behavior, every pivot, every turn, am I moving? Am I taking this job? Should I marry this girl? Am I taking which school? Every decision. When is the time to move on? When is the time to settle down? What is the right decision? It has to be I'm in his embrace. I am reporting and I am accountable to him. And therefore, no matter where, no matter what, we're always in his arms. And that's why it was legitimate and acceptable and understandable to learn that halacha from there. Perak Yud, Pasuk, Bez. Moving right along, we're still talking about the traveling. How do we know to travel? When they would summon, when they would call the entire people to Moshe, or that it was time to break up the camp, we're about to hit the road, everybody to the gate, stop buying overpriced water bottles and hummus containers that don't have enough pretzels proportional to the hummus in them in the airport store. They're boarding. It's time to go. How would they alert everyone it was time to go? They would blow the chatzotros. They would blow the silver trumpets. They would blow the silver trumpets. The Torah says, Ase make two silver chatzotros. Ase lecha. The word ase is understandable. You have to make. But why does it say lecha? Make what? For yourself. Says Rashi, 
Asay lecha make for yourself. Ata ose umishtamish behem velo acher. You make these chatzotzot. They're good for you. They're not good for anyone else. These were for Moshe's exclusive use. His status of a king. These trumpets were his. They were hidden right before Moshe's death. And even Yehoshua, even Moshe's most loyal servant, Moshe's most loyal successor, most loyal student, even Yehoshua did not know where they were. Why? Why did the Chatzotzeros need to be individually to Moshe? Why was it Asay Lecha? Not Asay, not just make or fashion them, but Asay Lecha, make for you. Why did Moshe need his own? Why did they need to be different than everybody else? Why did they need to be different than everybody else? So many say this, the Chesko Abramsky says it among others, that the reason is every generation needs their own Chatzotzeros. When you want to call the Eidah, when you gather the people, when you want to move people, when you want to inspire people, when you want to transform people, when you want to move people, when it's time to move, when you want to pivot, when you want to change, when you want to grow, when you want to break out, every generation has its own language. Every generation has its own vocabulary. Every generation has its own address. Some people live online, some people live offline. The chatzot so it's to reach the people online. How do we bring Torah? And how do we challenge people to grow spiritually, religiously, to be better and best versions of themselves? You have to go by Hushem. And so the means, the tools, the vehicle, the instrument, the language, the vocabulary to reach people in every generation will change. And that's why it was chatzotros asay lecha. Moshe, these chatzotros, they work for you. But you know, Tavshin Pei Beis in 2022, when there'll be something called the internet, maybe social media, every community has different means and people live in different places, but we have different vocabulary and different ways we connect, different styles of minyanim and different approaches and different creative ways that we are going to reach people who respond differently. Every generation, says Rechez Galbramsky, needs their own chatzotros. Even the very next generation of Yeshua couldn't use the chatzotros of a Moshe. The vocabulary, the language has to change. The way that we reach people, the programming, the activity, the changes. So when it comes to Torah, we don't say, well, that's not the way we used to do it. It's not the way it was done before. Every generation, within reason, under the guidance, supervision, under the approval of our Gedola Yisrael of every generation, we have to explore what are our chatzotras, what language, what tools, what vehicle, what works for us, and what should we be using? How can we get the message across for our generation? Well, you've been so around. Yeah, we have time quickly, maybe. Ketinokos haborech mi beisayfer. We know by Ibn Saharon was to separate Peranios, and Tosfos says they were like young children. The bell goes off. We're reading Parshas Balos. The school's over in Florida almost over in New York, school's over, kids are counting down, and when that last bell rings, they will not walk, they will run. Excited that school's over, they'll run away, and that's the way we were. That's what Tosu says, that we ran away from our Sinai three days. Three days, the Ramban writes, Amr Shema Yar Belonu Mitzvah. Let's get out. Get out with 613 before he gives us more. Let's get out, let's break out, let's get away. One does Rav Zedel Epstein, or second Rav Zedel of the day, in his beautiful Sefer Ha'aros. I'm grateful to his grandson for giving it to me. Zed Lepshin wonders. I don't understand. This is the same Kla Yisrael that Api Hashem Yachanu Api Hashem Yiso. I thought they board and they and they uh, get off the plane all based on the instruction of Hashem. So if they traveled and they journeyed those three days, it's because Hashem told them to. So now we're going to hold them accountable. Now we're going to disparage them. Now we're going to talk about them like they were children running away from school. I thought they only traveled based on the guidance and approval and direction of Hashem. Number one. Number two, Chazal calls this generation that Madar Kadosh Baruch is called Doros Lomaz Doros Hayeroi Lekavos Atorei Al Dora Midbar. Kadosh Baruch Hu measured and evaluated all the generations, says the Yalkut Shemoni and Chabakuk, and he found the only generation worthy of receiving his Torah was this generation of the desert. So these are such a lofty generation that they deserve receiving the Torah. Such a lofty generation to get the Torah, and yet we are disparaging them now by saying they ran away. How could it be? So Rizid Lepstein has a beautiful insight, and he says. Yeah, they left because Hashem said to left to leave. If they left, it's only because Hashem said to go. Because otherwise, they wouldn't go. They couldn't go. They followed the direction of Hashem, and they were on such a high level. Where did they go wrong here? Hashem said to leave. Now, when shul is over, when shul is over, it's legitimately over. You don't have to stay in shul longer than it's over. When the shear is over, the parsha shear finally ends. You don't have to listen. You don't have to watch. You don't have to stay longer than it is going on or taking place. The question is not whether it's legitimate to leave. The question is, how do you feel about leaving? Do you say, oh, I wish it were still going. I wish it never ended. I was enjoying that so much. 
I felt so elevated and enriched. I feel so empowered. I feel so connected. I wish it never end. Or do we say, thank God, so happy it's over. It can't be over soon enough. The issue is not that they left because Hashem told them to leave. The issue is, what is the attitude that we have? What is the attitude? Again, this is a theme of our Parsha. We saw it at the beginning with Aaron Shiloshina. We saw it with the Pesach Sheni, Lama Nigara. And now we see the Kala Yisrael are held accountable, not for leaving and not for the journey, but for the attitude they had on it. They exhaled, they were relieved, they were grateful it was over, rather than being disappointed and wanting it to continue to go. Okay, last. Last insight. And we saved maybe the best for last. This is Gevaldik, a Geshmak, a Geshmak Torah. Perak Yud Aleph, the next Perak, and uh, Pasuk. Hey, but yeah, I'm can miss Onan and Ra. So much to say about this. Miss Onan and Hitbael, they were not complaining. They were a nation, a group of complainers. Hashem heard. He got really angry. Moshe Davins, you know the routine. Been there, done that before. Zacharnu, what do they complain? Zacharnu es hadaga asher nochab b'mitzrayim chinam. We remember the fish that we ate for free in. Egypt, and we remember the kishuim of atichim. We remember these uh, vegetables that we had, and the uh, onions that we had, and the garlic that we had, and we remember, and we remember. Rashir says, we remember the fish we got in Mitzrayim, chinam, for free. What is chinam? Chinam means not the fish were free, but chinam min ha mitzvos. Oh, we remember before Hasinai. We could eat, we could do, we could enjoy, we could experience, we could... Um, have intimacy with whoever we wanted, whenever we wanted. And then we got the Torah and it limited us. It put such boundaries and borders. They weren't complaining that the fish was free. They were remembering nostalgically when they were free. Free from mitzvos, chinam mita mitzvos. Wonders the Megid Yosef from Yosef Saratskin. Wonders the Megid Yosef. Even if they longed for being free. But still, what is this connected to the mun? Here they're complaining about the mun. No taste, it's bore, it's texture. They're complaining about the mun. What does the man have to do with complaining or remembering nostalgically when they didn't have mitzvahs? Good. And why fish? That's what they're longing for. Meat. No offense, Rabbi Moskowitz, who love salmon. No offense to people who love fish. It's all about the meat. It's all about a good piece of flesh. So why are they recalling nostalgically the fish that it was free? Rabbi Bachai has a long discussion of this. But listen to what he says, the Nekid Yosef. Fascinating insight. He says... Where do you see the difference of a holy and an unholy person? Where does our Jewish identity really shine and show? In the way that we eat. We eat with holiness. We give a whole shear. You could find it on our YouTube channel. We gave a whole shear about the Jewish perspective or attitude towards eating. Eating is one of the holiest activities we do because we need to eat to live, which means that all that we eat is Hashem's way of entering us to give us chiyas, to give us life. So do we have a mindfulness? Are we present? Do we eat what's kosher? Do we make a bracha before and after? Do we eat healthy amounts? Eating is part of our worship and service of Hashem. Eating is a holy activity. That's what we say. We're challenged. We're tempted to not eat in a holy way. Set a table before me. When we sit before our set table, we're before our enemies. The enemy is saying, indulge. Eat instinctively, impulsively. Overeat unhealthily. Don't be grateful. Don't make a bracha. Don't be present. Don't be mindful. We're neged so rai when tarach lefanai shulchan. That's why it's called lechem, milchama, bread comes from war. We're at war when we're eating. We're struggling to elevate. When the Nisra left Mitzrayim, they were pursuing a spiritual life. But they thought Torah would only address their spirituality. They didn't realize that Torah would have something to say for their physical being. What is Torah have to say with my food? What is Torah have to say about how I eat? Torah is for shul, the way I daven. Torah is for the way I learn. How I eat, that's personal. It's secular, it's mundane, it's profane. They didn't accept that. They didn't accept that. Eating is a place of great taiva. Eating is a place, one of the places that we confront our greatest appetite. The word appetite is applied most in the world of eating. We have an appetite, we have a drive, we have a temptation. That's what they longed for. That's what they longed for. Why did they long for fish? Why was the fish free? So then Tziv says, you know why? Because fish, there's no shechita and no malicha. There are very few laws of kashas with fish. With an animal or a chicken, you have to shecht and you have to inspect and you have to make sure it's not a treifa and you have to salt it and remove all of its blood. Fish, if it's a species that's kosher, 
fish, you clap it on its head, catch it with a hook in its mouth, and you're good to go. It doesn't have to be slaughtered in a certain way. It doesn't have to be shechted in a certain way. And there's no trumus and maestros and chala. Ubasar ton shechita manas kahuna. Meat has slaughtering, and there are gifts from the meat that you give to the kohen, and fruit have bikurim and trumus and maestros. Only fish is free, and that's why they long for fish. The reason there's a connection between the man and longing for fish and remembering when they were free of mitzvahs is because free of mitzvahs means they wanted to be free of the gashmias mitzvahs, free of the mitzvahs that speak to even how we eat and having to curtail our appetite for food and our appetite for other forms of temptation in life. That's what they were complaining about. That was the source of their complaint then. That's what we need to be careful and avoid in our complaint now. It's been wonderful. Next week, again, we're only online, streaming live. Uh, join us again, Parsha Perspectives, Tuesday morning, 9.30. If you've not yet signed up again, one and one campaign, vrsonline.org slash one and one. Dollar a day of with daily giving, minute a day of Torah learning. That's the uh, Moskowitz. Have a 